Our most gracious and holy Father in heaven, we're so thankful for every gift that we have, Father. We realize that each good and perfect gift we have comes from you. Father, we pray for this congregation. We pray for the elders of this congregation. Father, we ask that you bless them with wisdom, that they may lead and guide spiritually as you would have them to. Father, we're so thankful for Trent and his family. Father, we ask that you bless them. Father, bless him as he is about to bring your word to us today. Father, we ask that you be with all of us. The example that we set at home in the world, Father, we realize that we're just we're weak and we're sinful, and we, we do so many things, Father, that are just contrary to your will, Lord, but forgive us when we do fall, when we're sinful, Father, and we do things that disappoint you. But Father, help us to get back up. Help us to find the strength, Father, to be the kind of example that you would have us to be, that we put you first in our lives, that you are the center of our lives, that you're the center of our families. Father, be with this church. We ask you to bless the example that it sets in this community and throughout the world, Father. Bless our endeavors. Father, we're so thankful for your love for us, for Jesus who gave his life, for your love to send him, that we can have hope of heaven one day through obedience to your gospel. Father, we pray that we never take your love, your mercy, and your kindness for granted. Father, we know that there are many of our number, not only of our number, but friends and family of our number that are hurting. Father, whether they're on beds of affliction, suffering physically, or Father, their hearts are just heavy. Father, we ask that you be with them, be with their caregivers, be with their families, give them strength in this time of trial. Father, we pray that you would help us to do whatever we can to give us the opportunity to ease their burden in any way that we can. We ask that you be with us as we go throughout this service. Father, bless us and take us home safely. It be your will in Jesus' name. Amen. The invitation song will be 140. 140. Before I listen, 107. 107. You all might stand while we sing this song. <coughs> Since the love of God has shed, Christ's blessings on my head, I have made it my own. I don't know how to get my heart, that it never may depart, it shall ruin.
Good morning. It is great to see you this morning. Thank you for being here this morning and worshiping the Lord together with us. Uh, if you weren't in class, you, you heard that our uh, PowerPoint, our projector, our computer system has had some problems, and I appreciate uh, James and Mickey working so diligently on that. Uh, and Brandon, too, I believe he's going to be taking the, the computer and re imaging that. But thank you to all those guys working behind the scenes and all they do. That, uh, that means a lot. Uh, but sorry, we will not have a PowerPoint this morning. That does mean that you will need your Bibles if you are typically depending on me posting the scripture up. So I will not have that this morning. I'm also going to change something a little this morning. Um, because of our singing tonight, which I hope that you will all come back out for our singing tonight. Um, our one word study is talking about heaven. And I thought that deserves so much more than just a devotional thought that I'm going to talk about heaven this morning. And tonight we'll talk about Matthew chapter 7 verse 6. So this morning we're going to talk about heaven. I also want to encourage you to be part of our Wild Marriage Seminar. I understand that um, one of the, the men of the congregation had this great idea. He said, you know... I'm going to buy my wife a notebook. She's going to take notes through this whole thing. And he was really impressed because the whole time she is diligently just taking notes. Well, the next morning he wakes up and there's all these things on his mirror. What Barry England says you need to change in your life. Well, you know, encourage you to be a part of that. Uh, great time. I, I hear all the great things that Barry is teaching and I hope that it is improving your marriage. Do you remember the movie The Wizard of Oz? Do you remember that Dorothy and her dog Toto get swept away by the tornado and they end up in the magical land of Oz? You know, but while she's there, she, she's desperately seeking someone to help her get back home. Well, you know, at the end of the movie, Glinda, the, the good witch of the north, she says, you know, if you click the ruby slippers three times and say there's no place like home, you'll get to go home. Have you ever had a desire to go home? Now, I'm not talking about your house just a few miles away from here. I'm talking about heaven. Have you ever thought that that's really the home we should be seeking? That should be the home we should be desiring? We sing about it, don't we? This world is not my home. It goes, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. What are you longing for? What are you looking to? Are, are you so caught up in this world that you lose sight of what we should really be looking for? Sometimes I think I am. I don't think I think about heaven enough. I don't think I, I have that strong desire like Paul has. Paul says in Philippians 1, 21 through 24, he says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. But listen to what he says. He says, My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain with you in the flesh is more necessary on your account. You know, Paul understood he, he understood he had this awesome responsibility while he was on this earth to help people come to know God and our Savior Jesus Christ and to help them to live a faithful life. But he never lost sight of the goal. He says in Philippians 3 verse 14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So what was Paul's goal? What was he aiming at? What was he focusing on? 
the prize. And what is our prize? Isn't it heaven? Isn't that the thing we should be longing for, the thing we should be seeking after? I want to obtain that. But why do I struggle? Why do I struggle seeing it? Why do I even struggle thinking, am I even going to make it? This morning, I want us to look at five reasons, five things that might help us to know the same thing that Paul knew, the same thing that Jesus' disciples knew. When he said to make sure to have your calling and election sure, I want to know that I'm going to heaven, but I also need something there that's going to help me seek it, to long after it, to want to be there, so I keep it on my mind and in my heart. The first thing, I want us to remember that Jesus himself prepared a place for us. If you will open your Bibles to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you will be also. Have you ever really thought about those words? You know, Jesus is saying that to his disciples, but this, these words are for us. Jesus has gone himself back to heaven to prepare a place for you. How awesome is that? How amazing is that? That, that Jesus is there and, and there on the sign. It says, home of D.W. Shelton. Home of Tim Bacon. Home. Of Warren Williams. How awesome is that to know that your name is right there because Jesus has prepared a place for you. That's what he went back to do. He has prepared a perfect place for his faithful family. Second, I want to go to heaven because it is a perfect place. How often do you think about heaven? How often do you think and imagine what it's going to be like? Revelations chapter 21 does, a does an amazing job of helping us to come up with an idea of what heaven might be like. If you will, open your Bibles to Revelations chapter 21 because we'll spend the next few minutes there in Revelations 21. In verses 1 through 4 it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away and the sea was no more and I saw the holy city new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adoring for her husband listen to how it described it right there as a bride adorned for her husband you know I remember back in 1998 standing in front of the auditorium at the Iuka Church of Christ and I remember when those doors opened and there was Lori more beautiful than I could have ever imagined. Just thinking how amazing this is. You know, that's the description he gives us right here. When you get to see heaven for the first time, it's going to be so much more than you could ever imagine. So much more than you could even hope for. It's like a bride adorned for her husband. And he goes on to say, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with him and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the formal, former things have passed away. Parents, do you remember when your child was little? When, when they had, were running or maybe they're riding a bike and they fall and they skinned up their knee? Or maybe it was that day when they came home from school and somebody had just hurt their feelings, kind of broke their heart. Or maybe, it, maybe it's when they're dating and, and that person that they really like broke up with them. Do you remember what it was like when they came to you? What were they looking for? They were looking for you to comfort them, to hold them, to wipe away their tears. Did you notice who's going to wipe away our tears? When we get to heaven on that day, who's going to wipe away our tears? God himself is going to wipe away your tears. 
He's going to comfort you. How amazing is that? That the creator of the earth, the almighty God, is going to take time to wipe away my tears. Lowly little me. Did you notice that it said that there's no more death? You know, as I think about this life, there's a lot of hardship, a lot of heartbreak, a lot of anxiety with death and thinking that death is going to come upon the people that we love. There's no more mourning or grieving that loss. There's no more crying, no more pain. I don't want any of that anymore. How great is it going to be that I have no worries, no concerns about any of that when I get to heaven? But it's, he goes on to talk about what heaven actually looks like. In verses 9 through 27, it says, Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride and the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and on the gates the name of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke to me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its, twelve, and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its height. And he measured the city with his rod, twelve thousand stata. Its length and its width and its height are equal. And also measured its wall 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first jasper, the second sapphire, the third a gate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth ameth amethyst. I worked really hard to try to get all those out. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the city, and the streets of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. How amazing does that sound? How perfect does that sound? But now listen as it continues in verse 22. He says, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it its glory and the honor of the nations. Listen. But nothing, nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only, only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. It's a perfect place for God's perfect people. Now understand, you're like me. I'm not perfect. I continue to make mistakes. But the thing I have to remember is the blood of Jesus Christ is what makes me perfect. And when I was baptized into Christ, I had that blood washing my way away all of my sins. And that blood continues to wash away my sins. The grace of God is continuously on me as long as I'm striving wholeheartedly to live my best for God. So that when I have to stand before God one day, I get to stand before God one day. I know that I'm perfect in His eyes. And this perfect place was made for God's perfect people. But you know, as I look through and I listen to all of that, it's still hard to imagine, isn't it? I had a chance one time to go to the Grand Canyon. You know, I had seen pictures on TV... I'd seen pictures in books. I'd heard people talk about it, but it was nothing like seeing its beauty 
when I went there. To see its design, how it was made, how amazing that was. See, I think heaven's going to be the same way. See, through this, His Word, we can get an idea of what heaven is like. But it's not going to be anything like the day we get to walk through those gates. And we get to see its perfection and everything it's like. Something we should all long for and continue to strive for. Third, I want to go to heaven because I want to see those heroes of faith. Those men and women in the Bible that we've studied about for so many years. Can I be honest with you? I want to sit at their feet. And I want to hear Adam and Eve tell how they were there at the beginning. I want to hear them describe the Garden of Eden, how perfect it was, how it was like to walk with God during that time. I also want to hear what it was like during the fall when they had to look back at that perfect garden, but they were on the outside. I want to listen to, Mo, to, to, uh, to Noah. I want to hear what it was truly like those hundred years as he was building that ark. As he went out and he tried to share God's message with people trying to get them to turn back and no one would listen. I want to hear what it was like from his wife and from his kids as they got to watch Noah in action. The story I want to hear from Abraham is what it was like when God said to sacrifice Isaac. The feelings that were going through his heart. Knowing that as we hear in Hebrews chapter 11, he says I, he knew that God would raise him back from the dead if he did it, but still having that tremendous faith. To talk to Moses and hear about the ten plagues, to hear about what it was like when that wind blew and divided the Red Sea so over a million people could walk through. And as they turned back and they saw the chariots come at them as that, mo as that water collapsed. And what it was like going on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. I want to hear from David. When he was out on that battlefield as a shepherd boy. And all of a sudden in the distance is a ten foot tall man of war. A beast of a man who had killed thousands upon thousands. War was nothing to him. And here's this shepherd boy. And what it was like to run across that field with nothing but a sling and a rock. I would love to hear his story. And the apostles. To hear what it was like all the stories that we don't know in those three years of ministry, that they were right there beside Jesus. And what it was like at the end of that three years when they watched him being nailed to the cross. And what it was like when they saw him come back from the dead. And they saw the holes in his hands and in his feet and in his side. And Paul hearing him talk about his on the way to Damascus when the light shone from heaven. How amazing that could have, would have been to hear Jesus. I want to hear the stories. I want to hear from their point of view. I want to hear from these heroes of faith and how they did it and what they did and how they overcame. And there's so many more. Fourth, I want to see my family. Have you ever thought about that? Have you really thought about seeing your family in heaven? There's not going to be anything like being there on judgment day and hearing God look at Lori saying, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. As he looks at Emma, Kate, Lindley, and Jacob, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Knowing that this huge responsibility I have as the spiritual head of the household to know that they made it. How awesome is that? To think that one day their spouses, their future kids, their future grandkids, their great-grandkids, all of those, because of the decisions that I make in this life, to know that God's going to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. How awesome is that? To know they get to walk through those gates, that there's a place prepared for them as well. I can't wait to see my parents. And Lori's parents. I can't wait to tell them thank you for the influence they had on our lives, to the spiritual difference they made. 
all of my family, my friends. But can I be honest with you? I can't wait to see you. You know, the thing that I understand more and more all the time about the Lord's church is it takes family. I need a family to help me get through this life. I need my church family to do that. And can you imagine on that day that we're all standing there together. We're all celebrating because we know the line that we're in and we get to watch each other as they stand before God and every one of us gets to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. We all go in together. Do you know how awesome that would be? As we look around this room right now, we get to see everybody, every one of us going to heaven. There should be nothing more important in this life than knowing that's going to happen for each one of us. That's where we have to be every single moment of every single day of our life. I've got to start caring that much about you. I need you to start caring that much about me. So we together can do this. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes energy. But it will be worth it. It will be worth it. Fifth, and most importantly... I want to see God. I want to see my Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to see His Holy Spirit. Then it'll be worth it all. Revelations chapter 22, verses 1 through 4 says, And the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree... We're for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And His servants will worship Him. They will see His face. You know, the children of Israel, they had this belief. They believed that the greatest thing about heaven is being able to see God face to face. You know, I agree with them. And if we miss out on that point, we miss out on the purpose of heaven, of our creator, the ruler of, of this world that will help us get to heaven. And there's going to be Jesus Christ at his right hand, the savior of the world, the Holy Spirit, the helper, the comforter. If, if we're not longing to see them, we're not ever going to make it. You know, as important it is, it is, as it is, that I know that Jesus prepared this perfect place for me. As important as it is to me to be able to sit at the feet of the heroes of faith, as important as it is to know my family, my church family, is going to be in heaven with me. Nothing can be more important for me to stay focused on through this life than knowing that I get to see God face to face. His Son and my Savior, Jesus Christ, face to face. His Holy Spirit, face to face. Nothing can be more important than that. And that's how we should be living our lives. Because if we're not living our life that way, why do you think we're going to get to heaven? See, it's prepared for His perfect people, the people that love Him, the people that seek Him, the people that desire Him. So what about you? This morning, what about you? What does your life say about how you want to get to heaven? More importantly, what about your heart? Because your heart's really where it all begins, where it is. Because if your heart's not seeking that every day, it's not going to happen. And how do you change? How do you become the person that God wants you to be? Do you really want to go to heaven? Are you like me sometimes we just get so caught up in this life and the things of this life that we lose sight of what's really important? I challenge you today. Make this a priority in your life that you're seeking the things that are eternally important. Because not does it only depend on you, it depends on your family. Have you ever thought of that? Do you know what it's going to be like that, that you're the deciding factor for your spouse? That you're the deciding factor for your kids. That you're the deciding factor for your grandkids and your great-grandkids and the, their children and their children. You. 
You are laying a spiritual foundation that your family will never forget. So what about you? Are you the person God wants you to be? This morning you may be saying, no, I'm just really not. Or maybe you're saying, you know what, I haven't even started. I haven't put Christ on in baptism yet. I, I'm not part of His church, His family, His body that gets to go to heaven. And you know what, I want to start today. If there's anything we can do for you today, please come now as we stand and sing.